No one can live for more than three days without water. Today, our supply of life-giving water is critically endangered. Our attitudes towards water vary greatly depending on where we live. In the developed world, most of us take it for granted and use vast amounts. In other parts of the world, water is viewed as precious. In some countries, people, usually women, walk over six hours a day just to obtain it for their families. The reality is that our water resources are finite, and it's estimated that the entire global water supply will decrease by a third in the next two decades. This will affect all of us, including those of us who have never had to worry about where our water comes from. The time has come for us to think differently about our invaluable water resources, and we have to make changes that have a sustainable long-term impact. Because if we don't, we won't survive. I was 12 years old when I first learned about the world water crisis. It was the summer before I started grade seven. I knew my school was going to have a science fair that year, and so I was excited about doing a project. I didn't know what I wanted to work on, though I knew that I wanted to do something that might in some way help people. That summer, I read newspaper articles, researched online, and talked with my parents about topics I could work on. Whether it was sitting at the dinner table or driving around, we often talked about some of the big issues that were going on at the time. When I came across the world water crisis, the magnitude of it struck me. I found out that almost one billion people lack sufficient access to water. I found out that our water supply is limited, and I found out that the rest of us are using water at a rate that reduces this supply, and there's no magic tap that can fill this back up again. Groundwater aquifers, one of our oldest water resources, are being depleted at rates faster than it can be replenished. Water is being diverted on a large scale, causing lakes and rivers to dry up. And pollution further reduces our supply. Every day, sewage, industrial, and agricultural waste, equal to the weight of the human population, is discharged into our water. Now, all of this puts pressure on our fresh water supply, making it harder and harder to satisfy a spiraling demand. And this just isn't sustainable in the long term. I found that those who have the least access to fresh water are the world's poorest, living in areas lacking water infrastructure. I wondered if I could develop something that could provide water for them. It was very important to me that if I was to do this, it would have to be sustainable. I didn't want to create a problem while trying to solve another. So I wanted to develop something which didn't require an energy source or produce emissions. I thought about accessibility, I thought about affordability, and I thought about sustainability. Now that summer, on one of our camping trips, I had a typical camping experience. Water rolled down the inside of the tent, making my pillow wet. Now this is water that had condensed from the air onto the surface of the tent during the night. The process that produced this water was dew formation. When air cools enough, water vapor in the air condenses into a liquid, and this is what we know as dew. I found that water is abundant in the atmosphere, in volumes of over 1.8 million liters per person on Earth. There are even animals, like the Australian thorny devil, which use this water to survive. They live in dry and hostile environments by condensing dew on their own bodies. The atmosphere is everywhere, and so I realized that if I could harness its water, it could be universally accessible. And I realized that there's no practical technology that did this. And so I wondered if I could develop something that could capture this water. And that became my grade seven science fair project. My goal was to create a device which could operate on its own without water infrastructure or an external energy source like electricity. A device which could extract water from the air, reproducing the process of natural dew formation. 
In other words, an atmospheric water condenser. Over the next several years, I added layers to the project, improving the design to where it is today. And so, this is the current design. The inside of the condenser consists of an arrangement of metal surfaces for water to condense on. Once water condenses, it'll flow into a collecting basin. Now, dew doesn't form every night, and so cooling the condenser becomes key to collecting water. To do this, I designed three components which increase the cooling rate of the condenser without needing a power supply. The first is a reflective coating, which re reflects away heat radiating from other objects and the ground. Now, the second is called a parabolic reflector array. Now, arrays like this might be familiar to you from office building ceilings, where they're used to disperse light. The, the array sits over top the condenser and cools it by reflecting heat away from the surfaces toward the cold night sky. And the third component are radiating panels, which conduct heat out of the prototype and radiate it to the sky. Now, I also treated the condenser surfaces with a substance similar to one found on leaves, and this allows condensate to flow and be collected. So when all these components were put in place, the atmospheric water condenser collected water, and condensation occurred in the system throughout the night. The highest rate I observed water to collect at was 265 milliliters in an hour. I was clearly remember the morning where I first collected water. The collecting basin was full of drowned flies. I was delighted there, there was enough water there to do that. <laughs> the atmospheric water condenser has the potential to provide water to those with little or no access to it. At some point during my development of this system, I wondered, what about those people who have access to water, but that water is contaminated? Over 80% of sewage in developing countries is discharged untreated into bodies of water, and people out of necessity have to drink this water. This causes four billion cases of diarrheal disease a year and the death of over one child every minute. So I thought about trying to develop an, a, another cost-free system which could convert non-drinkable bacterial contaminated water to drinkable water. Now this idea isn't new, and there's already a device called a solar still that does this job. A solar still is basically a box filled with contaminated water and covered with a glass sheet. During the day, sunlight evaporates this water and organisms in it are killed. They're in use on a small scale, however, they don't produce much water currently. I realized that a solar still that produced larger volumes of water could be extremely practical in areas lacking sanitation, since many of these places have warm climates with consistent, abundant sunshine. So I decided to try to design a novel solar still, which could produce more water than traditional stills. And so my solar still system consists of multiple evaporating basins, which together can hold large volumes of contaminated water. Once sunlight evaporates this water, it'll flow over, the vapor will flow over condensing surfaces, where it will condense back into liquid water. The solar still was able to purify contaminated water by removing all physical and bacterial contaminants tested for. Innovations like the atmospheric water condenser and solar still could be used to provide water to isolated communities and disaster situations. They could also be used to supplement urban supplies where it's inconsistent. They can do this because they require no existing water infrastructure or, en or energy source. The prototypes also show that it's possible to create things which can collect water without an adverse effect on the environment. It represents a different way of thinking about how we can obtain our water. I'm privileged to live in the world's largest freshwater ecosystem, the Great Lakes, but the big picture is this. 
Much of the world is facing water scarcity. And if we keep going down the path we're following, over the next couple of generations, most people on earth will be severely affected. The old ways aren't working anymore. In my projects, I wanted to find a new way to provide water. I wanted to get clean water to people where it's needed in a way that would have no negative impact on the environment. Now, I'm not the only one thinking differently about water. Water shortages have driven innovation and sustainable practices in some parts of the world. Now, you may be thinking, what's the point of telling me this? I'm not a water policymaker, or I can't contribute to the development of sustainable water solutions. But we all have the power to make change happen. We can start by changing our own behavior, by learning to conserve and treasure our water, and by insisting that water be a key topic in public and private forums. History has shown us that public opinion can force change. We didn't get to this place because we don't care about our future. We got to this place because we didn't realize that we have to treat water sustainably. We now know otherwise. We now know that we have to think and act differently about water to have a future. And that future lies in all of our hands. Thank you.